Okay, welcome to our lecture today where we'll be talking about BiPAP. BiPAP stands for Bilevel Positive Airway Pressure. And what that means is that you have positive pressure on both inspiration and expiration. If I want to draw a graph with this, usually if we breathe to normal air, it's zero or negative pressure. While using a BiPAP, what will happen is that whenever you take a deep breath in, the machine will help you with some pressure. And then even on expiration, it will give you some pressure. So let me clarify that. This is inspiratory. This is expiratory. This is inspiratory. And this is expiratory. This machine will detect once you take a deep breath. Once that happens, that will trigger the circuit in the BiPAP and will tell the BiPAP, please give more pressure to the patient. And that will create this curve on the inspiration. But while the patient is in expiration, the machine will still give pressure but it's not as high as the one that you have in inspiration. So this could be, let's say, 15, and this is 5. And this is what they usually say, oh, the BiPAP settings are 15 over 5. What that means is that the higher number is the IPAP, or inspiratory positive airway pressure. The lower number is what they call the EPAP which is the expiratory positive airway pressure. If you have watched our other video talking about the CPAP, EPAP is kind of equivalent to the CPAP because it's the pressure that they have as a baseline. So, what does IPAP do and what does EPAP do? Let me start with the easier one, which is the EPAP. EPAP improves oxygenation and it prevents alveolar collapse. EPAP makes sure that your alveoli are still open even though you're in expiration because that makes taking the next breath a lot easier. What does IPAP do? IPAP will give you good pressure to make sure that your lungs inflate so basically you are helping the patient who is really tired who is using his accessory muscles to take a deep breath in now the more difference between the ipap and the epap or what you can call delta pressure so IPAP minus EPAP, that corresponds to how much ventilation you have. So if you have someone on a setting of 20 over 5, delta pressure will be 15. If you have someone on 15 over 5, his delta pressure will be 10. This patient will have more minute ventilation because of this difference. You're able to get more air in than this patient. After learning those concepts, how are you going to use this in your daily life? The question will come in as follows. You have a COPD patient who's huffing and puffing, who is wheezing, and you do an ABG and you find out that he's acidotic and his CO2 is 60. So this patient has probably resp respiratory acidosis. And what's, what's your next step? You say, okay, I wanna lower the CO2 down. 
I want to make it 40. Well, how are you going to do that? In order to do, uh, drop down your CO2, CO2 is inversely related to minute ventilation. So, if you increase minute ventilation, your CO2 will go down. And just by going back to this sentence, we said that the more delta pressure you have, the more minute ventilation. So, the best answer would be, I think this patient is tired and getting sleepy because of the CO2. This is what we call CO2 narcosis. I should probably put him on a BiPAP. Someone will ask you, okay, which settings do you want to use? All those numbers are just, you know, haphazard what we usually use. So you can say, I can start him on 10 over 5. I can start him on 12 over 5, 15 over 5. No one cares. Just start with any of those numbers and then you will see along. Let's say that you, it's your first day on the ICU and you start the patient on BiPAP 10 out of 10 over 5, so 10 inspiratory and 5 expiratory. You come back in half an hour and then you repeat an ABG. And you found out that the patient's CO2 is still 60. What are you going to do next? You're going to say, hmm, I think on the settings that we have over here, his delta pressure is 5. So, in order to increase my minute um, uh, ventilation, I should probably increase this delta pressure. So, as an educated intern, and I've seen this before, I'm going to say, I'm going to put his BiPAP settings to 15 over 5. And the delta pressure over there will be 10. So, the patient will have more minute ventilation and he'll be able to get rid of all that CO2. You come back another half an hour and then you do an ABG and you found out that the patient's PCO2 is 45 right now, which is very closer to the normal level. The patient feels well and the patient is less tired and the patient is not confused anymore. So this is how the question will come in. What do you want to do? Do you want to increase the inspiratory? Do you want to increase the expiratory? Or do you want to increase the delta pressure? Well, yes, you want to increase the delta pressure by increasing inspiratory. But you might get another patient who is very similar. He also has COPD. But this patient has low oxygen and high CO2. So we got one problem, we got two problems. If you made the decision to start him on a BiPAP and you started with 10 over 5, let's say that his CO2 initially was 60 and his O2 initially was 40, and you've had him on too much um, oxygen, let's say. You've had them on 50% oxygen or so. What do you want to do? Again, this is your first day in the ICU. You say, okay, I've heard this number before. Let's put him on 10 over 5. And then you do another ABG in half an hour. And then they call you and you say, you know what, doctor? His oxygen is still 40 and his CO2 is still 60 and the patient is acidotic, then you will say, hmm, I haven't done anything. Why is that? You got to check. Is your BiPAP working? Does the patient have any leak? Is the patient taking good breaths in? But also look at your settings. And most likely, you got to play with your settings. So, what do you want to do? Do you want to increase the inspiratory pressure, expiratory pressure, or both. So, let's give you a couple of scenarios. 
If you say I want to do 12 over 5, that will increase your inspiratory pressure. That will make your delta pressure as 7. All what this will do is just drop down your CO2. If you say I want to make it 10 over 7, this will make your delta pressure as 3. So this will actually make your CO2 go higher and will make your oxygen a little bit higher because of the expiratory pressure. Yes, you might have helped his oxygenation, but you made the patient more sleepy and tired and now he doesn't know how to breathe because he's more sleepy. And then you can say, you know what? How about I do 12 over 7? The delta pressure is 5. If you compare the delta pressure 5 to the delta pressure we have before, it hasn't changed. So basically, your CO2 will still stay the same because delta pressure is the same. The only thing you would help him is oxygenation will improve. What are you going to do to this patient? Well, your upper level comes in and he says, what are you doing? Put the patient on 15 over 7 settings. That will give you a delta pressure of 8. So in this patient, you have increased the delta pressure from 5 to 8. So his CO2 is going to go down. And then you have in increased his end expiratory pressure from 5 to 7. That will increase his oxygenation. And this is what you should do. In this case, you have increased his minute ventilation. And you have increased his oxygenation by preventing the collapse of the alveoli. In your exams, EPAP might not show up this way because this is the, the, uh, the, the term we use whenever we're talking about a BiPAP. But if they talk about mechanical ventilation, you know, after you intubate a patient and you put him on the breathing machine, they would use PEEP instead. And PEEP basically means positive and expiratory pressure and this correlates with the EPAP it's just the same but instead of saying EPAP they use PEEP so whenever you see this word you can remember it correlates with EPAP on a BiPAP who are the patients that will benefit from a BiPAP always remember COPD exacerbation you can use it for heart failure because still you're giving increased pressure on expiratory and that will prevent alveoli collapse and that will also push fluids back to the uh, blood circulation also anyone who has muscle problems so someone who's weak someone who has been in the hospital for a while and they can't take a deep breath you might use that but don't use it on someone who cannot breathe at all like someone who's intoxicated also remember that there's um, a variation of sleep apnea which is called central sleep apnea in those patients, they might use a variation of a BiPAP instead of a CPAP. But it will hardly show up on your exam at, at this point. But the most common indication for it is COPD exacerbation, someone with a high CO2, and you want to help them breathe. And the reason why we use a BiPAP is because BiPAP comes before mechanical ventilation. Long time ago, before they have invented the BiPAP, we used to 
just intubate the patients directly. But now they have discovered that this BiPAP has saved us from intubating patients. And in exams, instead of saying BiPAP, you will hear this word, which is called non-invasive positive pressure ventilation. And the, re the reason why they use this word is because BiPAP is actually the name of the machine, while NIPPV is basically the name of the process, non-invasive positive pressure ventilation. And if NIPPV does not work, then what's your next step? Mechanical ventilation. Thank you for watching.